Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We'll take hold of it, be doers of it. We thank you for the fruit that will come forth from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. This morning we were sharing with you on the subject of bringing your life into divine order. God has order, and he wants everyone of us to come in line with his order, which is all walking after his word and after the commandments of the Lord. Colossians 2.5, Though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Join in beholding your order. He's seeing the order that's in your life. If you do have order, you're to come in line in the scriptural order, not your own, but God's, because you submit unto him, you make him Lord of all, you do what his word says. And also he says it's about the steadfast of your faith in Christ. Well, God wants us to come in line with his word, to see him bring forth what he purposes. And we spent much time talking about many different scriptures about how God works to bring us into divine order and the things that are necessary and required of us. We see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory, we've been called to his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. When he talks about suffered a while, not a good translation. It means, down here, as Young's brings it out, <coughs> having suffered a little. Not that it has to go on for a time. You will have a little suffering because you will be persecuted. We talked about the fact that everybody who lives godly shall suffer persecution. 1 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly, those are the ones that are hearers and doers of the word, in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. You will have persecution for righteousness' sake as you walk in the ways of the Lord. But God wants us to know that this suffering is only be to be a little we will have. God will deliver us out of everything. He delivered Paul out of all the things that came against him. And he will deliver out of us of all the persecutions and afflictions that come against us. So the God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that you have suffered a little. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We talked about this word after we talked about the order that God wants to bring in your life and order in line with his word. Here at Spot Speak, this is the word katarizo, which we saw many of the scriptures that spoke about that this morning as well. And this speaks about seeing the experiential work being accomplished of putting you in order, completing that work, making you what you ought to be, bringing you to the place of being arranged according to God's ways in your life. You submit to Him, you put Him first place, you do what the Word says. And by the way, all these statements of making you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, every single one of these are in what's called the optative mood. It is a mood that's a rare mood, only used some 68 times in the New Testament. The optative mood is a mood that is describing something that is his wish or his desire. He desires. That means this isn't automatic. He's not going to guarantee it. As far as just because you're born again, you've got to meet the conditions. If you will do what he says, he will accomplish this. But this is his desire. It's not something that he says is going to automatically happen in your life. If you meet the conditions, we will see it. And he wants those to happen in our life because he wants to make us to come to the place of being sound, complete, being put in order in our life and see the completed work of Jesus Christ. The next word that we're going to talk about is this word, sterizo. Here it's translated establish. The Lord wants you, as you put your life in divine order, and you see this work be accomplished in your life, he wants to bring you to the place where you are stable, you are firm, firmly placed, you are set fast, you are fixed. Nothing can move you whatsoever. That is what he also wants to bring you to. So you do not give place to any attacks of the enemy. You overcome everything that would come against you. So this is referring to you becoming stable, firm, set fast, fixed, not changing, not moving, immovable, nothing moves you whatsoever. That means you're not going to be up one minute and down the next. 
You're not going to be wishy-washy, you know, you're doing the right thing, speaking the right thing one minute, and now you're over here in the flesh and speaking things that are contrary to the Word of God. No. You're not doing the Word one minute, and then over here not doing it. No. We're talking about you come to the place where you're going to be stable, firm, fixed, and this is the way you live. This is your lifestyle. This is the way you live all the time. In other words, you come to spiritual stability in your life. You are fixed. You are immovable. This is the way you live. And that is what God wants. To show you that this word has this strong meaning, we can even see it from the picture of the gulf that was, was between the upper compartment of hell and the lower part where there was torment. Here in Luke 16, 26, besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would pass from thence to you cannot neither can they pass to us. This is when the man who was that rich guy who was in torment while Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and there was a great gulf fixed. They could not, there's no way that they could get from one to the other. And it means it was fixed. It was impossible to be able to get to one place or another. Otherwise, it was set. It was fixed. It was a, a set, a movable thing. And that's what this word is talking about. And that's what God wants to bring you to the place of. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it came to pass when the time was come that he, speaking about Jesus, should be received up, that he was going to go to the cross and accomplish everything, and then, of course, go on up to heaven having finished the work. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Otherwise, it was time to do this. And when it says he steadfastly set, this is this word, sterizo. He set himself. Nothing was going to deter him. Nothing was going to move him. Nothing was going to stop him or hinder him whatsoever. That is what this word is talking about. God wants to make you come to the place where nothing's going to deter you. Nothing's going to hinder you. Nothing is going to turn you any which way. You are going to be set, fixed, firm on the things that God wants. As he was steadfastly set his face, and he was going to go there, and that is what God wants for you. That means you're not going to let anything deter you. You're not going to let the circumstances deter you. You're not going to let people deter you. You're not going to let relatives deter you. You're not going to let circumstances and situations might happen suddenly deter you away from the things of God. No. You set yourself that you are going to carry out the things that God wants for you in your life. And Luke Chapter 22, and verse 31, and verse 32. This is the Lord speaking to Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, that was also his name, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. The word desired is actually a form of the word iteo, which means a demand. And this particular word, as a demand, it is also in what's called the middle voice, the middle voice in the Greek is talking about the per subject, who is Satan, wanting something or doing something for himself, for himself, for his benefit. Meaning, Satan demands to have you for himself, because he wants to destroy you. He wants to stop you. He wants to hinder you. So Satan was demanding that he was going to have Peter that he might sift him as wheat. The word sift is a figurative word that means to try to overthrow one's faith. He wanted to overthrow him. He wanted to stop him from carrying out the things that God wants. The devil would like to do the same thing to you. He'd like to stop your faith, overthrow your faith so it does not produce victory. Remember, the victory that overcomes the world is your faith. And you have the faith of Jesus Christ. You can move every mountain. You can cast out every devil. You can receive every promise. You can resist every temptation, every attack of the enemy. You have the faith of Jesus Christ. And he would like to overthrow your faith. Well, if you give place to what the enemy brings, he could stop your faith from working. Your faith doesn't automatically work. As you will see, he goes on and says, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. In other words, your faith could fail. Though actually the word fail here is a present tense verb, which means 
ongoing action. It could continually fail. And it's also a subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood means it's a conditional statement. This is not a factual statement, that it will not fail. Your faith not fail does not mean that it's never going to fail. It literally says that your faith may not fail, which is the way Young's correctly translates it, meaning it won't fail if you meet the conditions. And you meet the conditions and have your faith operating, it'll bring victory for you. But it's possible that your faith could fail if you don't meet the conditions and do the things that he wants you to do. And he goes on and says, and when thou art converted, meaning when he got born again, of course nobody was born again at this point, remember. So when he got converted, he makes this statement. He says, strengthen thy brethren. And he uses this word sterizo. This is the word which means get your brethren to be stable, firm, set fast, fixed, not moved by anything. Because Peter was going to go and preach the gospel, sow the word of God in the people's lives and teach them the way of the Lord. And this is what his mission was. And when he speaks here, this is a command. He was commanding him, imperative mood, that he was to get the brethren to come to the place of being so fixed, so firm, so established, that nothing could move them whatsoever. That's what God wants for you as well. He wants you to get so firmly fixed on the Word of God, you know it works, and you're working it, and you are nothing can move you off of it whatsoever. That's because of the work of God. You can't do this in yourself, in your own ability. It's God working in you that brings you to this place because of the Word that you're hearing and doing consistently in your life. So, as we see, it's possible that your faith could fail if you don't protect it and guard it. It's also possible it'll fail if you don't work it. You've got the faith of Jesus, but you've got to work your faith and put it in operation. Remember, it's supposed to grow strong. If you will work your faith, it'll grow strong and you'll become able to accomplish every work that he wants. So he wants it to grow. So this is a command. So you've got to get your faith in operation and be doing the things that he says so he can bring you to that place. Now, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now, to him that is of power to establish according to my gospel, establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, he goes on and says in verse 26, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So here he's speaking about this, this to be established. And this is this word, sterizo. Now to him that's of power, and God has the power to do this, how does he do it? Through his word. How's this going to get done? Well, you've got to hear the word. You've got to get the revelation, which the Holy Spirit will bring the revelation of the Word of God to you. And as you get the revelation of this Word, and of course, for what purpose? For obedience. You be obedient to it. These guys were making it known to the nations for obedience of faith. And the Roman church was known as an obedient church. They got revelation and they were obedient and did the things that God wanted them to do. So the Word of God the revelation that he brings to you through the Holy Spirit, it has the power within it. The Word has the power within it, remember. And he, it's of the power, to him that's of power to establish you, to make you stable, firm, set you fast, according to this gospel, which you must obey, of course, in order to get to this place. So obedience to the Word is so important. You get revelation, you start doing the Word, you walk in it, Obedience to it, the power of God is going in operation. That's how you're going to get to the place of being set fast. Hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing the Word. Many people don't continue to hear it and do it and hear it and do it. I heard it once and I did it once and then they think that's all they need to do. No, it's a hearing and doing and hearing and doing consistently. We walk in this. The power of God works and it will bring you to the place of being stable, firm, set fast, fixed. Why? Because you're being continually obedient, consistent, hear, and doer of the Word of God. So here he's bringing forth the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. By the way, 
when it talks about preaching, so I'd make this comment. The stuff that we see going on in the body of Christ today is ridiculous. Preaching is not a bunch of hypey stuff to try to get you all stirred up and everything like that. The word preaching just means to proclaim. You're teaching the word scripture after scripture, and the preaching is proclaiming the truth. Not all this pump me up stuff trying to get you all stirred up, you know, and emotional. It goes on, it's ridiculous. There's, it's not the Lord. He's not in that stuff at all. It's all a bunch of soulish building you up, trying to get you all emotional and stirred up. It's simply the proclaiming of Jesus Christ as you proclaim these things and speak forth the truth. So that's what we do. We proclaim the truth, bring revelation of the scriptures, the power of God's at work to bring you to the place of being set fast, firm, fixed, stable, not moved whatsoever. We go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. First, I'm sorry, Thess Thessalonians, wrong, wrong one. First Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 2. He said, He sent Timotheus, our brother, and the minister of God and our fellow laborer, in the gospel of Christ to establish you. That's what his purpose was. He wasn't come just to give him some message or just teach him some truth or bring some revelation to him. It was to get him to the place, bring these guys to the place of being firm and set fast and established in the things of God, so that they're not moved. And to comfort you concerning your faith. This word comfort also means to be exhorting and encouraging you. That was really more what it's talking about. He's coming to set you fast, to get you fixed, firm, stable, and also to encourage you concerning your faith. Admonish you, exhort you, encourage you, that you, how your faith will work to bring forth victory. And he goes on, and then he says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Otherwise, if you're really set fast, if you are really come to the place of being established, firm, stable, you're not going to be moved by whatever comes. He said, don't be moved by these afflictions or these pressures that are coming, these attacks. God does not want you moved. You'll be moved if you are reacting to what the enemy is doing or what the situation might be. You need to react in the Spirit, according to the Word, continuing to put your faith in operation, speaking the Word, applying your faith, conquering the enemy, speaking the promises into being, putting God in operation, not allowing ourselves to react. And that's why he says, if you're going to get established and you're going to get encouraged and you're going to get exhorted you know, concerning your faith, putting it in operation, no man should be moved by any of these afflictions. None whatsoever. We should be able to stand firm in the midst of anything. Your faith should not be shaken by anything. If your faith is getting shaken, what's that tell you? You're not established yet. You're not seeing sterizo in your life. You're not set fast, firm. You're kind of having, you haven't got there yet. You keep hearing and doing the Word. You keep developing. It's, remember, you can't make yourself this way. God does it through the Word in you that you hear and do and you act upon it and walk in it and he will accomplish this great work. So this is why, of course, the more you apply your faith, and it grows and it gets strong, the more you apply your faith and overcome attacks against your faith, doubt, wavering, unbelief, whatever it might be, so you're not shaken, and you conquer the attacks of the enemy. If you get keep on knocked down by the enemy, then that's how your faith could fail, remember? But if you overcome all these things, and as you get strong in the Lord and you do these things, you will come to the place where nothing will shake you. Nothing will move you whatsoever. In 1 Thessalonians 3, down in verse 12 and 13, <clears throat> he says, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. God wants us to walk in love, increase in love, abound in love. A love should be just operating in everything that we do. And then he says, to the end, this is where it's going to take you to, to the end that he may establish you, sterizo, that he may make you stable, firm, set fast, and not moved in your hearts, that your heart would be unblameable in holiness. In other words, as you walk in love at all times, 
and you always function in love. You don't get into unforgiveness, resentments, bitterness. You don't react, get mad, get upset, you know, get attitudes and so forth. No, you come to that place, you're going to see the end result of your getting established, your heart, unblameable in holiness. So you handle things in the spirit according to the word of God, what God wants you to do, not in the flesh, not getting somebody pushing your buttons and getting you all upset, you know. No. We are going to get our heart established in holiness before God. And that's what he wants. Unblameable in holiness. That's where he's going to bring you to, you and I too. We are going to get our heart stable, fixed, firm, unblameable. And that's because the word's in your heart. The word's so strong in your heart, you won't be reacting. If you're a reactor, then guess what? You must not have the word too strong in your heart because the things that are in your, in your mind, in your flesh or in your soul and your emotions are rising up and kind of overtaking. Of course, demons will try to rise up as well. The more you cast them out, the more freer you get, the less influence that you'll have. But the key is having the Word in you, walking in love at all times, so that that's all that you do. That's how you function. You're not going to get out of walking in love at all times. You're going to walk in love, do the right thing. So our heart needs to get stable, fixed, firm, and this is true in anything you do unblameable before God, that's uh, what God wants to bring you to. Look at 2 Thessalonians. He uses this again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, over in verse 17. He talks about comforting your hearts, or again, in the, the word parakaleo, which can mean encourage or exhorting your hearts, and establishing you, this is this word shiridzo again, establish you in every good word and work. God wants you established in every good word, hearing the word, doing the word, established in it. You're so firm and set fast, nothing can get you off of it. And also in every work, because you're going to be working your faith, remember. You're going to be working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're going to be working your, your works, any, all the actions that you carry out, all the deeds you're doing, all your doings, they all need to be coming forth of what God wants for you to do so you're not working the wrong things. We can't be working evil things or things that are contrary to what he wants. Again, and this is also interesting when it speaks here about this establishing of this. This again is in the optative mood, meaning this is what God desires for you. It's not an automatic thing. It's not automatically going to happen that he's going to get you firm established in every good word and work. It's his desire for you. It's what he wants and what he will perform if you meet the conditions. That means we've got to get the word in us, hear and do it. We've got to be working the word in our life, carrying it out, being consistent, and not letting the enemy take the word out. Remember, the devil comes to take the word out of your heart. You're going to guard your heart. You're going to make sure he doesn't. You're not going to let any affliction or pressure or cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches or lust of other things choke it out. No, you're going to be a doer of the word, and you're going to be a, working the word in your life. And he wants to bring you to this place. And that's what he's speaking here. So that, otherwise, this becomes your lifestyle. This is the way you live. This is the way you think. This is the way you speak. This is the way you carry out in everything that you do. This is how you're going to become like Jesus. When Sterizo gets established in you, you're going to be walking like him. And that's what he wants in our life. We see another scripture over in chapter 3. Verse 3, the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. One thing we got to know, God is faithful. He will perform his word. You got to believe and trust in him. Don't think that he won't perform his word. He is faithful and you can absolutely know what he will do. And he says he's going to make you stable, firm, set fast. And he also will guard you. This word keep is the word philoso, which means to guard you from evil. You've got to have confidence in that. This is what he will do. This is actually a promise that he gives to us because of his faithfulness. And when it says here, this is a future tense statement that he shall do this, means this is a promise when you trust in his faithfulness and believe him. And that he will also guard you from evil. Of course, there's, you need to do what's necessary. You can't be walking in sin. You got to pray and put the angels in operation. They'll keep you and guard you from evil. And keep you, you know, walking in the word. You, keep, you declare what the word says. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I condemn every tongue that would rise against me. God will deliver you from all kinds of evil. 
that would try to come against you. He'll keep you from it. So that's also knowing God's faithfulness, trusting in Him, knowing that He will perform His word and He will bring you to the place. It's a promise. He wants this. Remember, it's not guaranteed, but it's a promise of what He says He will do for you as you learn that He is a faithful God. See, the more you know His faithfulness, the more you'll know what God will do. If you know He's faithful to perform the Word, why would you ever doubt? You know what He's going to bring to pass for you in your life. We see another scripture over in James. James chapter 5, over in verse 8. He says, Be also patient. This is the word macrothumia, which actually means long-suffering. We need to be long-suffering in dealing with people, long-suffering in circumstances. Remember that through faith and long-suffering, they were inheriting the promises. As your faith applied, you've got to be long-suffering in the face of circumstances that, are, that are, the enemy has brought against you. Whether you're taking hold of a healing or getting delivered or seeing God accomplish a particular thing or overcome a mountain, move a mountain or overcome some problem. So he wants you to be long-suffering and long-suffering towards people as well. You don't get upset with people. You don't get mad. You don't write them off. You don't, they don't do what you want them to do when such and such, you know, you're going to react in a negative way. We need to be long-suffering towards people. And he says, establish your hearts. This is this word sterizo. Again, notice this. We've seen this sterizo combined with the heart, haven't we, several times. It's the, in your heart. This making this fast, set, firm, fixed, stable, not moved, is a heart thing. Why is that? Because the Word is in your heart. The Word in your heart gives the motivation, brings forth desires. The Word out of your heart, the word in your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth. When you've got the Word in your heart, out of the mouth, the, the Word will come forth. Out of the abundance of what's in the heart, the mouth will speak, as the Bible says. So we want your hearts established. This means you've got to get the Word in your heart. You've got to guard your heart, because the devil, remember, tries to take it out. And you've got to be ready to overcome anything that would attack you. That's so important. Getting the word in you, of course, is mandatory. It'll set you fast, stable, get fixed. And so you're going to be long-suffering. You're going to have your heart established. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And he goes on and says, grudge not one against another. Well, if your heart's established in the right things, remember the other scripture said it's going to be established and blamable that you're in holiness. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. It will bring judgment upon you. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Grudge, this word, when you actually look this up in some of the lexicons, it refers also to murmuring or grumbling. Young's even translates it that way, murmuring. Don't be a murmurer or a grumbler. Now, that's not going to do you any good. That's coming out of the flesh. That's coming out of the soul, not coming out of your heart. God wants you to be speaking the word, speaking the answer. He didn't want you to be murmuring, grumbling, you know, these kind of things, grudging not against another. Otherwise, you're going to be condemned, see? You're going to be, which means you're going to be judged. Uh, we don't want to see judgments come against us. We want to be long-suffering towards people and situations and circumstances. He says, take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction. Remember, these afflictions, we're not supposed to be moved by these afflictions. They suffered afflictions and of long-suffering, of patience. They were long-suffering in the face of things that came against them. Whatever kind of things, suffering evils, troubles, distress, attacks that come against you, you need to be long-suffering so you don't let them get, take you, move you off. Move you off your faith, get you off hope, get you discouraged, get you down, get you depressed, get you reacting, get you upset. The devil, if, can he get you upset? If he gets you upset, there's a problem. We haven't come to Sterizo yet. We've got a work to be done. God's going to do that work. Hear and do and hear the do the word and get this long suffering established in your life so you're not moved by things. Behold, we count them happy which endure or blessed. Blessings come when you learn to endure, remain steadfast in the face of whatever's coming. 
Hupomone, this word for endure, is steadfast, which is remember that you possess your souls through hopomone, steadfastness. That's having steadfast in the soulish realm. You make right choices with your will. You think correctly and take the thoughts captive. You govern your emotions. You make sure that you are going to deal with things properly. You're going to be blessed if you are steadfast in the soul. He said, you've heard of the patience of Job, steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. You know, he never would curse God, even though he said a lot of things that were wrong. Nonetheless, his wife was trying to get him to curse God and die, remember? <laughs> no, he wasn't going to do that. He was, not, he was going to be steadfast. And then, of course, when he found out he was wrong, he repented, you know, and said, I've uttered all these things that are contrary to knowledge, and he repented. And then when he got right, God blessed him with twice as much as he had before. And he was already being blessed tremendously. So God wants you to get, be long-suffering. He wants you to be steadfast. And these are things. Long-suffering is one of the fruit of the Spirit. That would be of the heart. Steadfastness is of the soul. He wants your soul set, steadfast. Nothing can move you. You're not a reactor. Again, take a look at your life. Are you one that seems to, if somebody pushes your buttons, here you are, reacting. Well, we got some work to do. God wants to get you to the place where you are not reacting out of the flesh, out of the emotions, out of the circumstances, and those kind of things. We also see, over in 2 Peter, chapter 1. In 2 Peter, chapter 1, we see a lot of things that we've seen in the, in the past, but we'll come... Look, summarize some of these things we've seen in the past. He said, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. That's what God wants. And again, this word multiplied, this again is one of the uses of the optative mood. And it's the passive voice, meaning God's the one who will do this. It's his desire of what he wants to do for you. Grace and peace is not automatic. It will be multiplied to you if you meet the conditions. It's what he desires and how you're going to see it happen. Through the knowledge of God. The word knowledge, epigenosis, means precise, correct knowledge. That means we got to know the word exactly what it says accurately and be a doer of, of course, put it in operation in our life. He goes on and says, according to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Through this precise, correct knowledge again of him that's called us to glory and virtue. And then he says, he's given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. We've talked in the past how God does not want us to come short of possessing a promise of entering into his rest. So we are to possess the promises of God. And these exceeding great and precious promises, what are they going to do? By these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. You're going to become like him, like Jesus. Again, when it says that you might be partakers... Now that's not a, or might, the word be, by the way, is the word become. You might become, not be, but you might become. This is the word ginamai. That's why Young's translates it, may become, which is good here, that you may become partakers of the divine nature. That means it's a conditional statement because it is a subjunctive mood, meaning the fact that Unless you possess the promises, you'll never come to the place of becoming a partaker of the divine nature. But again, how do you get to the place of possessing the promises? Because you get the precise, correct knowledge of God, and you are hearing, hearing and doing it, put it in operation, in order to possess the promises in your life. So, and of course, you also, you overcome what the enemy would bring against you through the world. You escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. And then he talks about giving diligence, adding to your faith virtue, which is moral excellence. We must have that. Knowledge. Temperance, which is self-control. Temperance is one of the fruit of the Spirit that keeps the flesh under control. To that, patience is his hupomone, steadfastness, which is what keeps the soulish realm under control. Godliness, where you have been conformed to godly ways. You are now a hearer and a doer of the word, is how you come to the place of godliness in your life brotherly kindness, and then also charity, which is agape. You're going to walk in love at all times. If these things be in you and abound, well, that means they're supposed to not just be in you, but they're to be working in your life, abounding, 
overflowing, increasing. Otherwise, you're hearing and doing it, and this is the way you function all the time. They make you that you neither are barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge, this precise, correct knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning, the knowledge of God you get, if it doesn't stay in you and work, and you doing it to, so the, it comes to the place of abounding, bringing forth fruit, it doesn't automatically produce fruit in your life. It all depends on whether you do the Word and you're walking in the knowledge of God. He that lacks these things, that means the Word got taken out, He's blind. He cannot see afar off. He's forgotten. He was even purged from his old sins. But the rather the, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election. Or this means being chosen. It's the word for being chosen. Make it sure, set fast, firm. For if you are doing these things, if you might be doing these things, is what it literally is, or what, if you're doing, I'm sorry, if you're doing these things, present tense, that's correct, meaning ongoing action, you might never fall, not shall never fall, but you might never fall. Because this is the word for fall, and it is a subjunctive mood, meaning you could fall, but if you do things, you'll meet the conditions so you might never fall. You're going to have to do the word, otherwise you're going to fall for sure if you don't do what the Word says. And then he goes on and says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Why did they have to hear this over and over and over? Though you know them, they'd heard them before, and be established, sterizo, in the present truth. In other words, if you're going to come to the place of seeing this, of course, remember, if you're abounding in these things, you're going to make your calling and you're being chosen sure and steadfast. And notice, he said, an entrance will be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why he says, I'm not going to be negligent to, to put you always in remembrance of these things, even though you've heard them or you know them. Be established, be made firm, fixed, set in the present truth. So, you need to hear and hear and hear the Word and do and do and do the Word continually to get you to the place of becoming firm, set fast, fixed. You know, those people that, why well, I already heard that, I want to hear something else. Uh, because the guy's got the itching ears, he always wants to hear some rev new revelation or whatever. All. No, we need to hear things over and over continually and get it, poor, get it established in us as we hear it and do it and hear it and do it and hear it and do it in our life. We should always want that. I remember a lady years ago, she, after I'd, she came afterwards and I administered a message, she says, well, I heard you teach that once before. Like she was griping and complaining, you know. I said, yeah, and you're going to hear me teach it a whole lot more. <laughs> because you need to be hearing the Word continually. So uh, you're hearing and doing and hearing and doing. Put you in remembrance of these things, as he says, even though you know them. Ah, we need to keep them before us all the time. And that's so important. So as you hear the Word, do it. You're going to come to the place of being established, firm, set, fast, fixed, stable, in the truth of the Word of God. We've come to another place over in Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, here's where it speaks about the judgment in chapter 2 and 3 that's coming to the church. And he seeks, says about how I know thy works. And remember, your works show forth your faith. They show forth what you're following, what you're doing. And he said that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Oh, you're calling yourself something, yourself something, but you're dead. Otherwise, you're not a real deal. You're like a Christian in name only. You're, you call yourself such and such, but you know, you're dead. There's no evidence of it whatsoever. Be watchful and strengthen, sterizo, the things which remain. Meaning, if you don't have yourself stable, set fast, firm, and fixed, What's going to happen? You're going to lose those things. You're not going to maintain those things. They're not going to become your lifestyle. And if they don't become your lifestyle, that is kind of, you won't have them in your life anymore. They kind of just, what happened? I was doing this for a while, and now I'm not doing it anymore. 
Now, it needs to become your lifestyle, hearing and doing the word. And so he's saying, you need to make stable, firm, set fast the things that remain that are ready to die. <clears throat> Meaning, if it's not set fast, it would die. So that's a revelation telling you that until you come to the place of being stable, firm, set fast, and fixed in the things of God and not moved, you could easily have things be taken away from you, the enemy taken away, you fall away, you're not seeing this come forth with fruit, more fruit, much fruit in your life. You're not established in it the way you need to be. So you need to get to this place. When you get to the place of being stable, firm, set fast, and fixed, then things will not be leaving you. Why? Be leaving you, into mountain, not believe, but be leaving you or going away from you. Why? Because it's your lifestyle now. This is the way you live. This is what you live, the way you think, the way you speak, the way you do everything. And that's what he wants. And why was there a problem here? For I've not found thy works. It says perfect. That's not a good translation. I'll put the cursor over it. It is the word which means to be made full or to be filled up. This is why Young's translates it fulfilled or filled up before God. That tells you something. Your works have to be filled up if you're going to get to the place of being stable, firm, and set fast. Works of what? Works of doing the Word. Working out your own salvation. Working your faith. Carrying out the work of doing the Word. As you're doing the Word consistently, you're working the Word, and your works are so important. All the things that you do. Therefore, you've got to get to the place of doing the Word consistently that will bring you to the place of being stable, firm, set fast, and fixed. Until that time, you won't see the establishment of this. And you could lose things. Things could die out. And in this case, they had a lot die out already and ready to die. I've seen those people that were on fire for the word for a while, and then they get less and less. You see them less and less at church. You don't see, you can tell... You find out, well, they're really not in the Word like they should have been anymore. They're not hearing the Word. They're not doing the Word. They're not even involved in doing anything or in serving it whatsoever anymore. What in the world happened to them? <laughs> you can tell they're like a Christian in name only. The devil's come and taken all this out. They might have been once at a certain place, but now look where they are. I've seen lots of Christians that way. We're in one place, but they never really got it established in their lifestyle, so that's the way they live. If you have fallen away from some things in your life and you're not where you once were, you never got to Sterizo. Because if you got to that place, it would be your lifestyle. And that is what he wants. That's because your works have to be fulfilled in your life to bring you to, to uh, and filled up for you to come to that place. So, he says... Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I'll come upon thee. What's going to happen? If you don't come to the place of stridzo, set fast, firm, fixed, and keep the things of God in your life because of your works being fulfilled, otherwise the lifestyle, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to see a judgment come. That's what he's saying here. Hey, you've got to get on board here, which you received, heard. You've got to hold fast and repent and get yourself in line. Otherwise, you're going to see a sudden, like a thief comes suddenly, and you're going to see a judgment that's going to come upon you. And he goes on and he says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Well, how they defile their garments? They quit doing the word. That means they were doing something else. The ones that were, the few, were walking with him in white, they were walking in the word. They were worthy. They didn't defile their garments like the many. And then he says, He that conquers and carries off the victory, overcomes the conquer and carry off the victory, the same will be clothed in white raiment. This means the guy that's come to the place of Stridzo, he's clothed himself in white raiment, which is righteousness. He's been doing the word. This is his lifestyle. This is the way he lives. See, the one who does righteousness continually is righteous, remember, 1 John 3, 7. He who is doing righteousness continually, present tense, is righteous. And notice the statement, I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life. That's quite a statement. 
That means if you're a Christian in name only, that might happen to you. You're in trouble. You need to get on board and be a hearer and a doer of the word and let this become your lifestyle and get set fast in the things of God. That's so important in your life. Uh, we can't be allowing ourselves to fall back. If you fall back into all these things from time to time, you haven't come to Stridzo yet. You haven't gotten stable yet spiritually. That's not for condemnation. That's for you to be locating yourself saying, hey, I, I haven't arrived yet. I better get with the program and get in the Word and hear the Word and do the Word and get this to become in me such. Remember, you can't do it yourself. It's God who does it. The hearing and doing. And when God has accomplished this work, you will not be moved. You will be stable, set fast, and fixed. And God will do this great work. That's why you got to be a doer of the Word. you also got to guard your heart and not let this enemy have place in your life. We see another thing over in 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, it's all about how the earth's going to be all burnt up, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth he's talking about. Beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own this is a word, a little bit different word. It's a form of that word. The other was 4741. This is 4740, used one time. It's from 4741, if you see. So it's just another form of it. Sterigmos. And this is me, again, the firmness, the steadfastness, the one who's fixed, the one who's stable. Notice, you could fall from your own steadfastness. Otherwise, because you get to a place doesn't mean that it could, you could never fall from it. You need to be having the lifestyle of living the Word. That's why when you get to this place where you are steadfast in it, see, a person thinks, well, I could never fall. Hey, the Bible says, take heed lest you fall. Anybody could fall. Don't think for a minute that you could not fall if you don't continue in the things of God. You've got to guard yourself. You've got to be so established. And when you get established in it, you're going to live that way. And otherwise, it's got to be your lifestyle. If you're not, you know, it's not like, oh, I learned these things and I saw this happen and I saw this great accomplishment. Maybe I got a healing or I got a deliverance or I saw this prosperity. And then I turn around, turn away from continuing in that lifestyle. You can lose anything you've gained. We cannot have that. Remember the guy, he even said the guy in John chapter 5 who got healed there at the pool of Bethesda, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come on you. You're going to be in trouble. If you don't continue to walk in the ways of the Lord and you go back into sin, you're going to be in trouble. He says, beware. This means to guard yourself. It is imperative that you guard yourself because the enemy, remember, will try to attack the word. This is a command, imperative mood. This is a present tense. Always be guarding yourself. And it's a middle voice, meaning you're guarding yourself for you so the enemy doesn't get to you and take the word out. I mean, you could be having some word going, coming along, producing a lot of fruit, and then the devil will try to come and choke it out, get you to fall for lust of other things, deceitfulness of riches, you know, or cares of this world, anxiety, and take it out, and all of a sudden, you fell from your steadfastness. You fell from where you had gotten to, your firm condition. Now, what happened? These guys, this is, beware lest you be led away with the error. This is the word also means to stray away, like be deceived, of the wicked. It's interesting, the word here for wicked is this word ethosmos, which means one who breaks through the restraint of law and gratifies his lusts. You've got these lusts of the flesh. They'll try to work you if you don't do what the word says and guard them and crucify the flesh daily. You've got to stay on top of it. Those strong desires that will try to rise up against you, you can't give place to them for a second. Notice, one who breaks through the restraint of law and gratifies his lust. So what does the Word do? Not only does the Word show you the path that you're to walk on and how you possess promises and see God do these things, but it also works as a restrainer. The Word in you will restrain you from getting into things you shouldn't get into. Hey, the word on seeing about, you know, what the ramifications of fornication, you end up in the lake of fire and so forth, and seeing that, that'll be a restrainer. I'm not going to fall into that because I'm going to keep that before me that I don't make that mistake. And gratified the lust of the flesh, 
and go, instead of following after the word, walking in the laws of God, and then I fall from my steadfastness and the devil takes me down. God wants you to make sure that you are on guard at all times. We need to get stable, fixed, steadfast in walking in the Spirit, always according to the Word. Oh, that means you're going to deny yourself. You're going to live unto Him, not yourself, remember. And you're going to walk in line with the Word, spiritual law. If you don't, what happens? If you fall into this, this, uh, law, this not having the restraint of law, which means if you're not doing the Word of God, the New Testament law, the law of Christ, you must be walking after something else which means now you become lawless. And this is what's going to happen to people in the end. Because remember what it says over in Matthew 24. This is an end time chapter. The fall away crowd is going to have had this happen in their life. Because iniquity, the word anomia, which means lawlessness, because of lawlessness that will abound increase. You see it happening now, but it's going to happen a whole bunch. You even see a lot of these so-called leaders for our nation, they want to ignore all the laws. It doesn't matter what the law says. They all ought to be kicked out and fired immediately and resigned. They're not even fit for office. Because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many shall wax cold. You can't have lawlessness in you. Your love, and you say, well, this is not, this, a lot of people say, this is talking about the Jews now. No, it's not. It's talking about the Christians, because who has agape love? Only the Christians. It's the new kind of love, remember? So this is talking about born-again Christians, because it means the lawlessness which abounds, it gets a hold of them, meaning they must have been yielding now. They aren't walking after the restraint of the law. They're now yielding to the lawlessness. You can't allow this, this world, the spirit of the world, this lawlessness to get a hold of you. That's why you've got to be separate from the world. You've got to choose to walk the straight and narrow path. Many are walking the broad way that leads to destruction, remember. You cannot be compromising and a little bit of this, you know, the worldly stuff and so forth and think it's not going to take you down. No, friendship of the world makes you an enemy against God and you will be taken down. The enemy will use that. And what's going to happen? The love of many, that's not a few, that's many. Wax cold. If their love is cold, you know, the lukewarm gets spewed out. What's going to happen to the cold? They're done for sure. They're going to be finished. This is why we must be sure that we are guarding ourselves. Which also means you've got to set the boundaries in your life. You know, if you don't set the boundaries and you cross the boundaries, you're in trouble. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. This means to mark off from others by boundaries. Aphoridzo. The boundaries are set. I'm not crossing that line. You've got to set those boundaries so you don't cross those and get into areas of sin. Say at the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Don't even let that get a hold of you for a second, and I'll receive you. Otherwise, the enemy is going to take you down for sure. He tries to set you up. He knows your weak areas. You've got to get the word established in you. Any weak areas, you've got to get the word in you so strong that nothing will be able to deceive you and take you down. Spiritual law is what restrains you, see, from doing these things. So we need to get in line. That's why you've got to get the word so in you. You know, we've got to learn to bridle our tongue. Set no wicked thing before your eyes. Take heed what you hear and how you hear. All these things. How you react, how you respond, how you, how you deal with things. This is all so important. No unclean, thi unclean things, flee fornication, lust, eyes of adultery, remember it says these guys, can't cease from sin. we got to guard ourselves. All our members got to be guarded. Otherwise, there will be all kinds of problems that will come. God wants you to come to this place of being set fast and firm and at the place where nothing can move you. We also see 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. He says, watch. We've seen that before. You've got to be spiritually watching. Remember, when you watch and pray, you won't enter into the temptation. You've got to be spiritually watching and tuned in because the enemy will try to deceive you. You know, if you're not watching... You're not going to be able to overcome. You're not even fit for the battle. 
Remember with Gideon, the first 22,000 of the guys were sent home because of fear. But what about the next guys down to 300? They were the ones that were not lapping and watching at the same time. The water, they had their head down on the water so they couldn't watch or see anything. They weren't fit for the battle either. They got sent home. No. You got to be spiritually in tune. That's why it says be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, walks about as a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. You're going to have to stand fast and watch, be watching, and also stand fast. This is the word stako. A little bit different word, but it's a, it's a form of this. And it says to stand firm, to persevere, to persist. God wants you to get persevering in the things of God. Not be on one minute and off the next. You persevere. You're continuous. You're on. You're standing firm. You're persisting. You know, the devil's very persistent. You need to be more persistent than why he is. He will persist to try to get after you. You know, people that have control in Jezebel spirits will be persistent trying to get their way, you know. That's a devil operating through them. Anybody that's persistent trying to press you to get you to do things, you know there's a problem. Persisting. You've got to be ready to do what God wants you to do. You're going to be persisting, stand firm, persevere in the faith. And you're also going to be brave. Quit you like men is one word in the Greek which means to be brave. So you're going to have courage. And you're to be strong. You're to be strengthened. He wants you to be strengthened. Come to the place where you are manifesting great strength. This is a command. Every one of these are commands, by the way. They aren't suggestions. He's commanding these things. And present tense means ongoing action. You are commanded to continually be watching. You're commanded to continually be, st be standing firm, persevering, and persisting in the faith in whatever situation. He expects you to walk by faith and keep your faith applied at all times. We're not going to back off whatsoever. Remember, anybody draws back, he has no pleasure in you. You end up drawing back into perdition, which is destruction, as it talks about. We can't allow that. We got to stand fast in things. We see over in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, firm, per persevere, persist in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is something that's important for us today because there have been a lot of people in the body of Christ that have made great mistakes. The letter to the Galatian was talking about the Galatians, how they went back in the Old Testament law. They went back into the ways of the flesh. They went back into just doing their own, own thing, thinking that that could produce righteousness in them. No. Christ brought us to liberty and brought us out of all that. We're not under the Old Testament law. The law just brought the knowledge of sin, showing the fact that you, have, you need a Savior, you need somebody to set you free. Now we come into the New Testament, we come into the place of liberty. These guys were going back into the yoke of bondage, which was keeping the Old Testament law. We see a lot of Christians today that are going back into the Old Testament law. Stay away from them. Witness to them, but don't allow them to affect you whatsoever, because these guys are deceived. You must guard yourself. Stand firm, persevere, persist, that you're going to walk in the liberty of the New Testament, you're not about to turn back whatsoever. We see another scripture in Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation, the word conversation here refers to you as a citizen, your actions as a citizen, because this is a word which refers to you being a citizen, your citizenship. Let your citizenship and your action as a citizen, what are you a citizen of? of heaven, not of this place. Where'd your spirit come from? From above. You're a citizen of heaven. Let your citizenship be as becomes the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast, stako, firm, persist, persevere in one spirit, in one soul, not mind, it's the word suke which means soul. That's why Young's translates it this way, with one soul. And striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
Remember what it says in Jude, they were earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints because the devil came in and got all these guys off the faith. They were all, and all doing all these other kind of things. You're going to be striving together for the faith of the gospel. The devil will try to stop your faith from working and from you functioning in it and try to get you off track. No. What does he want us to do? You're, as a citizen of heaven, you are to stand fast. You're to be firm, persevering, and persisting in one spirit. And in one, this is the different. The word one here means only one. It's the word mia, if you notice below. Different from the other word one, which is the general word for one. This is talking about only one soul. Only one soul. Not be wavering, not be vacillating, not be on one day and you're off another, whichever which day you're going. No. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. That is what he wants for you and me. Stand fast in the word. He also says over here in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 8. For now we live if, well, that tells you something. It means if I don't meet this condition, I'm not really, really living the, what, what, what the life of God. If you stand firm, persevere, persist in the Lord. Meaning, hey, this is important. And this is a present tense, meaning you're to be continually doing this. And this, again, is subjunctive mood. Anytime you see an if, that's showing a conditional statement. You live if you're meeting the conditions of standing fast, firm, set, fixed in the Lord. Nothing is moving you whatsoever. So this is pretty important. You've got to get to this place. Otherwise, the devil's probably throwing you every which way. You're being tossed to and fro. That's why you've got to get the doctrine established. And we can't be tossed to and fro from all these doctrines of men and all these false things out there whatsoever. We've got to know the truth and the knowledge of God, the doctrine. And we've got to be not moved in anything that he takes us off track. Stand fast in the Lord. If you stand fast, then you're going to be able to live and have his life manifest in you. We see something else over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. 14 and 15. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, this is a call of God upon your life and my life. We are called to the obtaining to the possessing, obtaining. Possessing or obtaining this would mean. Otherwise, and it means in such a way like you're, for yourself, like owning one's property, this kind of word means, as you see below. It's possessing for yourself the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to do that. He wants that. It's part of the calling of God upon you in your life. Therefore, brethren, if you're going to get this, you're going to see this happen, stand fast. You've got to get firm, persevering, persisting in these things. Keep your standing. Nothing moves you. If you don't stand fast, you think you'll ever get to the place of possessing the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the manifest presence of God. It's not going to happen. He's not gonna, the glory of God's not going to manifest in someone that's full of sin, flesh, worldly things, on one minute, off the next, wavering every which way, up and down, all over the place. No, it's not going to happen. God will do this work in you it's because you're a hearer and a doer of the word. He wants to bring you to the place of being stable, set fast, firm, fixed, not moved. And as we see here, as we, we talk about this particular word, the stand fast, the firm, persevering, persisting, keeping your standing. Nothing moves me. You get to that place, you're on your way. Because you'll be working your faith, speaking the word, praying the word, doing the word, walking in love, handling every situation right. Nothing's taking you down. The devil's not getting to, into you. He's not having any place. He can't find anywhere to get into you because you're set. You're set so fast on the Word of God. Stand fast, and what do you need to do? Hold the traditions that you've been taught. You hold on to the traditions are of the Word of God. Not talking about man's traditions, but the traditions of God that you've been taught, whether by word or epistle. That's why you get the Word, you've got to get established, and you've got to know the Word. Not just, I heard that, oh, I heard that teaching. Well, about a couple weeks later, can, do you understand that teaching? Or know that teaching? Can you recite back what you were taught? Oh, I forgot. Well, 
We didn't get too established in it, did we? We didn't really uh, hold fast that tradition. We're not holding on to that, the traditions of these things. No. We obviously didn't quite get it. Yeah, we heard it. We got some knowledge, but we didn't really get it. You know, you got to get a hold of things so you know it, whether you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. He wants us to come to that place. That's going to be the key if you're going to obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we go over also, go back over to 1 Peter, and we got more that he talked about what he wants for us. He talked about how he wants to establish us, but also we see the fact that he wants to strengthen us. And this means to be made strong. It's only used this particular word one time here in the Greek. He wants you to become so strong that you have a spiritual strength that will be able to resist the enemy's attacks that would come against you. Now, the opposite of that is a word, you see the word is S-T-H-E-N with an O-O, then -O, O-O. The opposite of that has an A in front of it, as then O-O, -O, which means you're not strong or you're weak. And if you are in that situation, you're going to be in trouble. You're not going to have spiritual strength. So we have to make sure that we don't let ourselves get not strong. Matthew chapter 26, 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, prepared, and ready, but the flesh is asthenes. It's a form of this word, a little bit different, but it comes from that. Not strong with the A in front of it, which means not. It's a negative particle. So, well, that tells you, if you're walking in the flesh, you're not going to be strong. You've got to get rid of all the fleshly works. We're supposed to put off the old man, mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, crucify the flesh. We aren't going to walk after the flesh. If you're walking after the flesh, you will not have spiritual strength. You cannot, you're not going to have the spiritual strength. That's one thing. We also see the same word also used over in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things, asthenes again, of the world to confound the things that are mighty. What does that mean? If you have worldly things that have, are got, getting a hold of you, and you're walking in the ways of the world, that's going to make you weak as well. The weak things of the world. No strength in them. That's why you've got to be not conformed to the ways of this world whatsoever. And also, same thing that we saw before about in Galatians chapter 4, over here in verse 9 and 10, he says, Now after that you have known God, rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak, asthenes, and beggarly elements, where desire you to, wherefore you desire again to be in bondage? which was the Old Testament law, going back into it. The Old Testament law was weak, remember? It had no means to be able to bring you to righteousness. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. It would not produce that whatsoever. And of course, anybody that's observing days, months, times, and years is what they did in the Old Testament. They're not understanding. All these things are types and shadows that are pointing towards the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus already fulfilled the first four feasts. Why do people keep the feasts? No, you proclaim what the feasts have been fulfilled by Jesus of what, they've been, what he's accomplished. And the last three are what he's going to accomplish in his second coming when he comes. People that observe these kind of things, they're making a big mistake. They've gone back into the Old Testament law. I bet lots of people say, well, do we observe these things? We proclaim and teach the fulfillment. Do we observe Passover? No, we proclaim Jesus was the Passover lamb who would be made sin on the very day of Passover in fulfillment of it, unleavened bread, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, bearing away the sin in fulfillment of it, first fruits having been born from the dead, and then going back up to heaven, pouring out his blood on the mercy seat, presenting himself as the first fruits who having been born again from the dead, spiritual death and the spiritual life, in fulfillment of it. Otherwise, you proclaim those things. So we don't observe these things, we proclaim the fulfillment of them. 
we get lots of people that want to observe these things, which is a great mistake. In fact, you don't want to do anything of the Old Testament, walking in the Old Testament laws, you walk in the New Testament laws. Remember, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18. For there is therefore a disannulling, that means an abolition, abolishing, of the commandment going before. What's that? That was the Old Testament law that went before. For the weakness, asthenes, and unprofitableness of it. It wouldn't produce. Wouldn't produce eternal life. Wouldn't produce righteousness. It's only through the faith of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't produce the new creation. The Old, the Old Testament law, they do that could never bring a change. They had to get a brand new spirit. If it was weak and profit, profitless, profitableness, uh, unprofitableness, it did not produce the results. Therefore, anything of the flesh, anything of the world, anything of the uh, Old Testament law, Walking in these ways, observing these things, they're weak, and they will cause you not to be strengthened if you walk in line with them. We see lots of Christians that are doing that. They're not going to be strong because they, instead of walking in the New Testament that's going to produce the liberty and the strength, they're walking in the Old Testament ways, and that is a great mistake. One other one that we come back to over in 1 Peter chapter 5, what he said he wants for us. Not only does he want us to come to the place of, of this put in order, uh, made what we're supposed to be, completed work or perfection, and bring us to the place of being stable, firm, set fast and fixed, and then strengthened, because we don't walk in the flesh, we don't walk in the ways of the world, we don't go back in the Old Testament law, we're walking in the New Testament law, and we get strong in, in, because of the Word in us. And then he says, and settle you, which means... The foundation has been laid and established in your life. It's the word for laying the foundation. God wants the foundation laid in you. And of course, how do we get the foundation laid in our life? We see this from Matthew, or Matthew I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, the word heareth is present tense, meaning ongoing hearing of the Word. If you're not ongoingly hearing the Word, in the Word, you're not meeting this condition. And doing, doeth them, meaning you're doing the Word that you're hearing. Present tense as well. So what does God want? He wants you to hear and do the Word, hear and do the Word, hear and do the Word. Hear and put it in operation. And be a consistent doer. He says, I will liken him to a wise man, which built his house upon the rock, the rain descended, floods came, winds blew. That's the attacks of the enemy, a type of. And beat upon that house. You're the house of God. If the enemy's attacks beat upon you, are they going to do something to you? They shouldn't. If you have been a hearer and a doer, what have you done? You've laid the foundation and built this thing. It fell not, for it was founded. The foundation was laid, the same word. It was laid upon a rock. Nothing could move it. Over in Luke's account, <clears throat> in chapter 6, verse 48, or 40, yeah, 48. He's like a man that built a house, dig deep, laid the foundation of a rock. When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house. Same thing. It could, this means it did not have iscus, strength or mighty force, the word means, to even shake it. It couldn't shake it, or this really refers to overthrowing it. Couldn't overthrow it whatsoever. Couldn't shake it in any way. It means you're not going to be shaken. You're not going to be overthrown. Why? Because it was founded upon a rock. So what's the key? Being a hearer and a doer of the Word of God. Absolutely essential. We see another place where this is important. Colossians, that is. Chapter 1. First we'll read in verse 21 and following. Here it speaks of what Jesus accomplished for us. You that were sometime alienated enemy in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. He's reconciled us while we got born again. We come back into relationship with God. How did he do it? In the body of his flesh through death, bearing away our sins. To, and what's the purpose now of him reconciling you? 
to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. How are you going to come to the place of being holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight? The next verse tells you, if, here's the condition, you continue, you uh, in, and abide, dwell, remain in the faith, grounded, there's the foundation laid. You've got to have the foundation laid by being a hearer and a doer of the word if you're going to be presented holy, unblameable before the Lord. And settled. This is a different word, but it has a word that's very similar in the meaning, firm, immovable, steadfast, nothing's moving you. That's what he wants. It means you're going to have to get the foundation laid and you've got to come to the place of being firm, immovable, and steadfast <clears throat> if you're going to be wholly unblameable and unreprovable. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And also, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You didn't move over here for something else. You didn't follow some other doctrinal thing or try another thing, you know. No. You are established on the hope, which is the confident expectancy of the, of the Word of God, of the gospel, the good news, of what God will do for you, all the things He says. Otherwise, this is a key. You've got to have the foundation laid. You've got to come firm, immovable, steadfast, and you're not going to be moved away from anything. That is where God is going to bring you to. He wants you to come to this place. You do this, great things will happen in your life. We see again over in Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 20. They're built upon the foundation. Here's the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. See, they brought the word to us. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. How are you going to be in the place of being fitly framed together? Because the foundation's been laid. You've got the foundation laid. You're here and a doer of the word. You're going to grow up to the holy temple. You're going to be builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. It's all because of the foundation that gets established in you and laid in your life. That is what he wants. At the same time, you do have to conquer everything that is not of the Lord. Look what he says here also in relation to the foundation. 2 Timothy 2.19 The foundation of God that's to be established in you stands Sure. This is a little different word again, stereos, which means strong, firm, immovable, solid, hard, rigid. Nothing can move it again. And these are different, different Greek words, but it's all kind of the same point it's pointing to. The foundation of God is sure. It's set. It's, it's immovable, solid, hard, rigid, having this seal. And this is, means this is where you've, you've got this foundation laid in your life. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Because who are the ones that are His? They're the ones that have the foundation established, sure, set, rigid. Nothing can move you whatsoever. And then he also says, another thing that's important, if you are going to have, be this foundation that's sure, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The word iniquity is adikia, which means unrighteousness. Young's translates it that way correctly. Otherwise, you can't have any unrighteousness in your life. What's unrighteousness? 1 John 5, 17 says all unrighteousness is sin. So that means sin. Do we depart from all sin? We depart from anything that's unrighteous. We can't have that in our life. In a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Which means one is honored, but this is a guy who's a disgrace. Dishonored is a disgrace. Hey, we can't be a disgrace, a vessel of disgrace, no. What's going to determine which one you are? If a man therefore purge, cleanses out thoroughly himself from these, from the unrighteousness, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. That means this work has been accomplished. Sanctified is a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense in the Greek means action completed in the past, with the ongoing effect at the present time of speaking. Otherwise, hey, you are sanctified and this is the way you live all the time. And he's meet 
able for the master's use, and he's prepared, ready for every good work. And remember, God wants to sterizo us in every good word and work. Get us established. So if you don't come to the place of becoming a vessel of honor, you'll never get to that place. In order to get firm, established, and, and this foundation that's sure, that's rigid, that's solid, that's strong, that nothing can move, you've got to become a vessel of honor, which means all sin has to be rooted out. Every bit of it has to be eliminated from our life. The sanctification process gets accomplished in you to bring you to the place of being holy before the Lord. And that is what he wants. And that's what he's going to do in your life. A couple other scriptures. He also wants you to come to the place, as he speaks about in Acts 16, 5, says the churches were established, stereo, solid, firm, strengthened in the faith. That's what he wants. He wants you so strong in the faith. And we see again over in Hebrews chapter 5 where this is brought. And this also applies to us in seeing God accomplish what he wants in our life. You see, we're to grow up. And when you grow up, you're going to become solid, strong, and set fast. Hebrews 5.12, he's really telling these guys, you guys haven't been doing what you should have been doing. You're way behind time. For when, for the time, you ought to be teachers, you should have grown up to be a teacher, you have need that one teach you again. You haven't even got out of babyhood stage. The first principles of the oracles of God are become such as of need of milk, that's what babies drink, and not of strong, stereos, strong, firm, immovable meat or food. They hadn't grown up in the things of God. Everyone that uses milk, he's a baby spiritually. Why is he a baby still? Because he's inexperienced. In, unskillful means inexperienced. He's inexperienced in the word of righteousness. What does that mean? He hasn't been a doer of it. You get experience in something when you do it. Here and do and here and do. You get experience in everything. If you don't have the experience of working your faith and doing the word, how are you ever going to get anywhere? You're still going to be a spiritual baby. It means you can't just be hearing. You can't be a spectator. You got to be putting, you got to hear the word and put your, everything in operation, being a doer of it. He says, strong meat, this is for the guy who is growing up, belongs to those who are of full age, those who have come to maturity, the end result, perfection, which is teleos, come to the place of being, of being perfect, perfection. How do they get that way? God did it, of course, remember, even those who by reason of habit, use, really should be translated habit, by the reason of habit, continually. Hearing, doing, hearing, doing, hearing, doing, habit. How do you get things established so you've got good habits? Because you've been doing it and doing it and doing it. It's a habit. And when you've got a habit, that's the way you do it all the time. You don't do anything different. That's, that's my habit. That's the way I do all things all the time. Whatever it might be, anything you do in life, that's what he wants. By reason of habit, that's how you have grown up and become full age and come to the place of being strong and mighty before the Lord. One last scripture that we want to cover in dealing with the enemy as well. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where it said we're to be sober, be vigilant or watchful. Remember, we've got to be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, is a ruined lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. May devour is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning he can't devour you unless there's a way he can get to you. Sin would be one way. You had to give place to him. But you could not be sinning and still the enemy could come at you. That's because you've got to be ready to defeat his attacks and conquer anything that comes against you, regardless of what it is. You can be attacked by the enemy, regardless of whether you're walking in sin or not. He can try to attack you. Remember, Paul got hindered left and right. I mean, he wasn't sinning when he's going out to preach the gospel in that missionary journey. He got pummeled until he learned to use his authority and conquer the enemies. So he goes on, and what are we supposed to do? Whom, talking about the devil, resist, set yourself against, oppose, resist, 
stereos. It's not the word steadfast of hupomone, like you might think, steadfast in the soul. No, it's stereos. Strong, firm, immovable, solid, hard, rigid in the faith. You resist that devil, and you keep resisting that devil, and he's, you're going to be strong, firm, immovable. He's never going to get to you. If you've let the devil get to you, you obviously haven't come to stereos yet because he broke through. He kind of got to you. Now, God wants to bring us to this place. We're going to be resisting him strong, firm, immovable, solid. And how are you going to do it? Through the word. You can't do it in the flesh. You can only do it through the word. Again, this is because of God doing this work in you. And you'll come to the place where you'll resist everything when you are so strong and mighty, he's never going to get to you at all. But that's, again, because you've been hearing and doing. You've grown up by habit. You get experience in the Word. You're walking in the Word, and you see God accomplish everything in your life. God is going to do a great work, and He's going to bring you to the place. This is what He desires for us. And we'll look at this one more time. The God of all grace called us to eternal glory by Jesus Christ. You suffer a little because the tax will be there, but He is going to make you perfect. He is going to make you to be put in order, arranged, set, firm, become what you're supposed to do, the experiential work of God bringing you into divine order. He's going to make you stable, firm, set fast, fixed, bring you to the place of being strengthened. And he's going to, because of the foundation laid, you are going to come to the place where you've seen this total work. This is God's desire, remember. The work of God is accomplished in you. You're going to be like Jesus. You're going to be possessing all the promises. The enemy is not even going to be able to get to you. The attacks will not even shake you because you have full of power and mighty force and you're walking in victory. This is the gospel. This isn't something, oh, it sounds like just a, oh, a fairy tale, impossible. No, this is the truth. This is what God will do in you, but you can't do it yourself. God does it as you hear and do the word. But if you don't hear and do the word and guard yourself and do all these things, you'll never see it happen in your life. But if you do do it, God will perform it. And this is where we are headed. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of what you desire, what you purpose in my life. My life is to come in line with divine order, to be put in order, in line with the Word of God, and to experientially see this work be accomplished, repairing me, restoring me, making me what I ought to be, bringing me to the place of being like Jesus. And I thank you that I will come to the place of being stable, firm, set fast, fixed. Nothing moves me. I will not be moved. I will be strengthened. The foundation laid in my life. And I will become solid and rigid and firm through the word in me. I will never be shaken. I will have my heart established in this way. And I'll be operated in faith. The word will be ruling my life in everything that I do. I thank you, Lord. You want this to happen? You will perform this in my life as I do the word. I will hear and do the word and I will get so set, fixed, firm, established, solid, seeing all, all these things accomplished that I will become like you and I will see this work that you desire accomplished in my life because I'm a hearer and a doer of the word. And I do not give place to the devil. And I do not walk in worldly ways. And I will never go back to the Old Testament law. I walk in the New Testament law. And I will never give place to any sin areas. I will not walk in the ways of the world. I will crucify the flesh. I do not walk after my ways. I live unto him. I put the word first place in all that I do. Thank you for accomplishing this in my life.
because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. He will accomplish this as you and I do it. Father, I thank you for this word that's come forth this night. I thank you that we have ears to hear and we realize this is what your desire is for us and you will perform it. Thank you that we are going to come to this place. This is our goal. This is our vision. This is where we're headed. This is what you will accomplish as we hear and do the word. Thank you for bringing this forth in our life as we are hearers and doers of your word. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.